I'd like to talk you through today a journey that the urban poor in Delhi are increasingly facing. They are being forced from their homes in squatter colonies within the city center to lives on the periphery of the city. My research explores the aftermath of this eviction process and what resettlement is really like and challenges the idea that resettlement is something that is preferred by these slum dwellers. So one of the major events that led up to the eviction of a lot of people from Delhi was the 2010 Commonwealth Games, in which the government poured $6 billion into improving infrastructure, including building new highways, a subway system, and even allocating money towards potted plants on the side of the street. However, this, this huge investment led to a, a considerable loss of habitat for many people. 300,000 people were evicted from the city. And this is a trend that's actually followed or has been seen in other cities that have hosted major sporting events, such as Beijing, Cape Town, and it's ongoing in Rio. For those of us who think that this is something that is only seen in so-called developing countries, last year London also evicted 450 people. So you may be wondering who these people are who were evicted from the city. And they're mainly migrants who have come from villages and neighboring states of Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, and West Bengal in search of better livelihoods. Many of them came in the 1980s, specifically for the 1982 Asiad Games, another mega sporting event in which they were, they were hired to work as construction workers and day laborers. They settled down in whatever land that was available to them and built futures existing in Delhi for close to 30 years. At the same time, there was a slum-free discourse that was heavily mobilized by both politicians and wealthy residents who cast these slum dwellers as filthy, as polluting. And between 2004 and 2008, a series of settlements along the river Yamuna that cuts through the city was specifically targeted for slum clearance under the idea that these slum dwellers were polluting the river, even though this was shown to be not the case. This picture here shows the, the devastation that happens after an eviction as these people sort through their belongings and try to find, try to recover whatever's left. This is where I'd like to introduce my own research. Um, I focused at a resettlement colony in Bhavana, which is located 50 kilometers outside of the city center. And as you can see here, there's the river and that's where the Yamuna push the settlements were. Bhavana is about a three-hour commute on public transportation outside of the, the city center. So as you can imagine, many people's livelihoods were destroyed by this move. And for those who were evicted, um, their problems didn't just end there. As soon as they reached Bhavana, they were forced to, to prove their identity and also pay a month's worth of their wages. And for many of these people, that just wasn't possible as they'd lost this documentation in the eviction process. As Dilshad, one of the women that I interviewed, talks about, um, she talks about being left out in the open and not having anywhere to sleep. Um, so in this year, I spent my time interviewing residents and talking to them about what eviction meant for them and what, how, their lives are, how they're leading their lives due to resettlement. I focused on this because there's not that much research that documents the aftermath. And many people think that resettlement is something that is valued among slum dwellers. Some of the repeated themes that came up was this idea that people are increasingly forced to build up lives in these colonies, but yet face eviction. As one of the women that I interviewed, Kauther, talks about, she talks about how the government exploits the poor and makes us homeless from here and there. And this is especially evident if you look at the plot documents that they were given. The government has explicitly written that they only have the land for a 10-year lease, after which they can be moved at any time. So these people question, what is the point in investing so much time and money into these plots if they're to be moved? This picture also shows how the government has not invested in proper infrastructure, including sanitation, garbage, water delivery. And this is on top of the fact that they can't ex access their former livelihoods. Another man that I talked to, a Bengali Muslim named Mohib, he speaks about how the poor increasingly feel dislocated and left out of the developments that are taking place in Delhi. They see the new high-rises, they see the new infrastructure, but yet they are stuck in this colony that is outside of the city and not improving by any means. I hope that this, this study draws more attention to the fact that cities, especially in develop, developing countries, are expanding, they are growing, but what is happening to the poor in these contexts? 
Many of the slum dwellers would have portrayed their lives as, even though we might have seen slums as spaces of poverty, they see them as thriving places built with networks and net social networks and employment networks that have been vastly disrupted due to the resettlement. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kavita. Does anybody have any questions for her? Feel free to raise your hand, and I'll bring you the mic. Yeah? No? Toby? Hi, thanks for a really interesting talk. I was curious, what are some of the policy implications of the work you're doing, and have you come across any examples of slum either evictions or resettlements that have worked out well or are in favor of the poor? Um, that's actually a really interesting question. At the moment, I would say no. If you look at what's going on in Rio, it's the same situation, where they're being built homes that are on the periphery of the city. So I would really question any type of resettlement that does not factor in employment links. Because basically, you're moving people out to the middle of nowhere and expecting them to make their livelihoods and make a future for themselves without proper infrastructure and jobs. So that would be my answer to that. Was, did, was there anything else that you wanted? Uh, cool. Oh, hello. Yeah, thanks again um, for such an interesting talk. Um, I suppose I have my lawyer hat on, um, and I can't help but um, draw an analogy with the uh, South African dweller population. Yeah. Um, and they, I know they were moved um, away and had consequences for both their education and employment opportunities. Um, in the South African context, they actually drew on the South African constitution to bring a constitutional challenge in the, um, in the court. I wondered if something has ever been done that's similar in the Indian context, given that um, I know just from my own education that um, the Indian constitution has a lot of socioeconomic rights built into their constitution. Mm -hmm. um, so are you aware of any um, constitutional challenge or either one that's happened or is in the process of happening? Well, you're actually right. The Delhi, or the constitution does have a rehabilitation scheme that is built into it. The problem, though, is that even the Supreme Court is siding, on the, is siding with wealthy residents and people who seek to evict these groups. So at the moment, you have a judiciary in Delhi that's quite anti-poor and that seeks to move them out. So there's not much sympathy in the courts for the urban poor who bring their cases. And they're very much at the whim of whatever government comes into power, so a lot of election promises are based on, or a, or a lot of candidates get elected based on promises that they make to the urban poor who represent a vast voting majority. So, yeah, I think that's the problem with these groups, is they're not as well organized as a group like Dharavi would be in Mumbai. Um, so you highlighted in the beginning several different countries uh, where this is repeated, where when an international gaming Mm -hmm. event comes, um, this eviction will occur. So I know that things like the Olympics and what you listed um, bring a lot of economic wealth to the region and they invest you know, a lot of money into building up these games. Um, is there any ethical or like ethical and monetary compensation uh, for these evic evictions ever be, like, being considered when setting up these games or what are the bodies responsible for like, considering the impacts on these communities? and can you advocate to them? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. It's a little bit outside of my research, so I'll try to answer it as best as I can. Currently under, I think, the, both the Olympics and the World Cup organizations, they're required to ensure that the countries that are hosting these games do so in a way that's um, socially just and that's ethical. But at the same time, there is an immense pressure on these cities to provide the infrastructure that's necessary for the game. So in some senses, the cities are developing more rapidly than they can handle. And a lot of the decisions are being made at a very, very kind of quick and sped through process. So I think this is what happens in situations like Delhi and Rio. The fact that the, the social implications are not completely thought out or well thought out. And people were moved to these resettlement colonies before there was actually an investment in the surrounding area. So it's something that really needs to be considered, I think, for future games. But 
Sadly, it, it seems like Rio is just another case. It's, it's a similar case to Delhi. Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I think it's really interesting that you've had um, the opportunity to speak with so many people, it sounds, um, those who have been moved. Uh, I was wondering if you could describe, um, you mentioned the disruption of social networks as one of the primary um, uh, results of the move. Um, does, the, does this change um, it, uh, depending on generations? I'm wondering, essentially, is this, the, this process of building these social networks um, the ones that are disrupted in the slums area that you described as being moved, um, do the youth have the same uh, social network structures and do they experience the move the same way as older generations, I'm sure, um, um, have the, built up those social networks for far longer? But I'm wondering if there's a difference that you see. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think a lot of the older generation, the way that they would identify themselves would pr primarily be through their regional identities, whether they're Bihari or from West Bengal or from UP. But I think the youth, first and foremost, consider themselves Deliites, even though they are children of migrants. So they, to me, it seemed like they felt this disruption even more strongly, because the parents would maybe consider moving back to the villages, but this was something that was completely out of depth for a lot of these, these kids who consider themselves urban and Deliites. So yes, you could see a generational difference too in how the resettlement was approached and the kind of contingency plans people made. Great. Well, thank you so much for all of your questions. Thank you to Kavita for that wonderful talk again.